Good morning. Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church. My name is Jaron Fish. I'm the Director of Congregational Care here at Grace, and we'd like to welcome you to worship. This week, some things to take note of. Um, upcoming on July 17th, there is a caving trip put on by the Intergenerational Ministry Team. Um, that trip is going to the Lost Cave Creek, and it is open for all generations. And uh, if you do not know how to register for that, you can contact Jordan at gracemj.org. Also coming up very quickly is VBS and Vacation Bible School is a two-day event this year. It's going to be July 21st through 22nd and if you haven't registered for that and would like to join us you may do so on our website gracemj.org. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Good morning. I invite you to join me in this morning's spoken call to worship. Come, Holy Spirit, and breathe into our worship. Help us to bear fruit as we share your love. Where there is hatred, bring love. Where there is sorrow, bring joy. When there is strife, bring peace and transform our impatience into patience. Inspire us to practice kindness to all. When we encounter evil, let us respond with goodness. Lead us to a place of faithfulness and gentleness. Bring us a spirit of self-control. Come, Holy Spirit, and breathe into our worship. Help us to bear fruit as we spread your love. Come, thou fount of every blessing, Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, Sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, Mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, Hither by thy help I'm come, And I hope by thy good pleasure Safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God He to rescue me from danger Interposed his precious blood Oh to grace how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the 11th chapter of Matthew, Jesus says to his followers, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That scripture reminds me of this song. Give me your hand, 
I'd like to shake it. I want to show you I'm your friend. You'll understand if I can make it clear. It's all that matters in the end. Put it there if it weighs a ton. That's what the father said to his younger son. I don't care if it weighs a ton. As long as you and I are here, put it there. Long as you and I are here, put it there. If there's a fight, I'd like to fix it. I hate to see things go so wrong. The darkest night and all its mixed emotions is getting lighter. Sing along. Put it there. If it weighs a ton, that's what the father said to his younger son. I don't care if it weighs a ton, as long as you and I are here. Put it there. Long as you and I are here. Put it there. Put it there. If it weighs a ton. That's what the father said to his younger son. I don't care if it weighs a ton. As long as you and I are here, put it there. As long as you and I are here, put it there. Hi guys, I'm Miss Jamie. This morning in our children's moment, we are talking about Paul writing to the Galatians. So Paul writes a letter saying, hey, this is just a reminder, but if you guys are going to follow Christ, here are some things you need to remember. This is how you need to do it. Because sometimes, like all of us, they were making mistakes. They weren't following God like they should have. And even the people who were supposed to be the leaders of following Jesus we're making mistakes too. And Paul said, you're not really making the right choices. You need to show other people how to follow Jesus. So he asked them to have faith, not to try to show that they were perfect by doing everything right, because we all make mistakes, but he asked them to have faith and to believe in Jesus. So if I asked you to have faith in something, how hard would it be? What if I asked you to open this drink? Pretty easy, right? Now, what if I asked you? Would you have faith in me that it wouldn't explode on you? It's pretty hard to ask, right? I don't, I don't know if I would open it. But Paul says there are other people around you that can teach you new tricks on how to follow Jesus. They can remind you that God wants us to try our best to live for him and follow the laws that he gave us, but to also not worry when we make mistakes because Jesus forgave us. So now if I told you that I was doing a very special trick, would you trust me? Do you think that you would open it? Do you think it's going to explode? It didn't. I learned that trick by trusting someone else, by letting them show me. And sometimes we don't get to see the results of having faith in God because it's really hard when we can't see something in real life. But Paul reminds us that when we look around us and see everyone united in Christ, when we look at the people that are here supporting us at the church, and all the Christians in the world that are trying to follow God just like we are, then we can be reminded to have faith. Will you guys pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for today. We thank you for loving us and for sending your son to show us how much. We thank you for reminding us that we don't have to be perfect, but that you have saved us through our faith in you. Help us remember that you are good, 
even when we mess up, and that you will always forgive us. We love you, God. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. We've reached that time in our service for the congregational care moment. Please be mindful of these people and this, these situations. Add them to your prayer list as you're praying this week. Please continue to remember Sandy Bruns, Cindy Cather, as well as Kurt Cather. Both of those are um, Brad Cather's siblings, his brother and his sister. Continue to remember Ricky Gleaves, who is Richard Garten's brother-in-law. Please continue to lift up Sharon Coughlin, Susie Cochran, Janie Smotherman and family. Um, her mother and Luna passed this week, and so um, we want to continue to lift her up and her family up as they process that and journey in the days ahead. Please continue to remember Sandra West. Remember Denise Bills, who is Larry and Kay Ward's daughter-in-law. Um, she had a positive marker this week, which we're celebrating. And at this point, there is no need for chemo or radiation, but we want to continue to lift her up and pray for uh, big strides in her um, overcoming and fighting cancer. Uh, continue to remember Greg Kelly. That's Sandra West's son-in-law. Keith Winsett. Caroline Robertson, as well as Lyle Robertson, as Karen Hedges' parents. Please remember um, Dewey Klon and Dan and Sherry Corning's daughter, Megan, in your prayers this week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we come to you this morning and we lift up these needs and these concerns and those that are on our hearts and our minds. We entrust them to you, to your care. We ask that we would realize and know how we can be your hands and feet to those around us, to share your love and to represent who you are. We join our voices in the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Good morning. This morning, we're going to begin our new sermon series called Paul versus the Missionaries. We're going to be spending the next four weeks looking through the book of Galatians and discussing this relationship that Paul has and the controversy that um, is going on between the two. We're going to begin this morning by reading from Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. But when Paul came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face, for what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers, who were not circumcised. But afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy, and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. When I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter, in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? You and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. But suppose we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ, and then we are found guilty because we are abandoned, because we have abandoned the law. Would that mean Christ has led us into sin? Absolutely not. Rather, I am a sinner if I rebuild the old system of law I already tore down. But when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so 
so that I might live for God. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in his earthly body, in this earthly body, by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I did not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. May we be blessed this morning by the reading and the hearing of God's word. Let's pray. Good morning, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to be able to gather together like this and to worship you and to sing your praises and to turn to your scriptures as a community. And we pray this morning that as we turn to your scriptures, that you might open our ears, that we might hear. But even more than hearing, that you might touch our hearts, transforming us into the people that you've called and created us to be. I pray this morning for a clarity of thought, that when I speak, it would be the words that you have for us, and that you might hide me behind your cross, so that what we experience here today is you, your grace and your peace, your love, your joy, your justice, and your righteousness. We pray all these things in your most holy and precious name. Amen. So it doesn't take long uh, when you're reading Paul's letters to begin to realize that for Paul, the number one testimony that we have as followers of Christ to this world, to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, that um, was, was foretold in the Old Testament, that the number one testimony we have to support our faith in Jesus as the Christ is the way that we have come together as a community of diverse people. So for Paul, it is extremely important that you have Jewish people and Gentile people that are in this new community of faith that's forming. He, he wants to make sure that the Gentile people don't become Jewish people because then that, in the process, makes everyone the same again. And the great diversity of the kingdom that, that he believes is that sort of that crown, the crown of the kingdom, that, that, um, that, that jewel, if you will, of the kingdom, of the, the crown of the kingdom, is that it's the great diversity not that we all become one thing. Paul believes that's what's foretold in the, in the scriptures, and that's this message of Christ, is that all people are finally coming together the way that the, way that the Bible, the scriptures, told the Jewish people at the time, the way Paul understood it, is that they would all come together. Jew and Gentile would all come together, and they would all worship the Lord. And he sees that Jesus is the one that ushers in this time, this, this end time. And so the problem that Paul has, the reason that Paul's willing to go to battle against these missionaries is because he believes that this undermines the entire message. So here's a guy who believes that the most important thing is unity, and he's willing to fight. This is important for us to understand. He's not fighting. It's not Christians fighting against Jewish people. These are all people. These and prim, they're Jewish people, yes, but they're Jewish people that are now claiming um, to follow and to believe that Jesus is the Christ. So he's he's not he he's re, it's really important for him that Gentiles don't have to convert to Judaism. Because, again, the testimony is that, we're, is that we have an ability to live in a loving, harmonious, diverse community. And so most of Paul's letters really are about how do we do that? Because that's a difficult thing for us to do. We have this natural tendency as human beings to sort of migrate and find our own. I remember when I was young and I was getting ready to go off to college, um, my mom telling me that she really wasn't that worried. Yes, you know, I was leaving and I was going to be, um, I think it was like three and a half, four hours away. But she really wasn't that worried because she said, we have a tendency to find our own. 
And so she knew that I would find and I would, and I would, I would look for and I would gravitate towards people who were just like me. And so what Paul is trying to do, he's trying to say that we actually, Christ breaks those barriers down. And so his letter is about how do we do that? Because it's difficult. It is difficult to live with people that are not just like you. Sometimes it's difficult to live with people that are just like you too. But, but how do we do that? And so this argument is between the missionaries that have shown up in Galatia and Paul. Um, it's an argument between fellow followers of Christ. So why does Paul, who believes so much in harmony and so much in, in living together in great diversity, why is he willing to battle these people? And so over the next four weeks, we're going to look at this and we're going to break it down and we're going to look at the, the specific issues that he has. Now, today, Christology is the title of the sermon. And basically what I'm saying is that one of the problems that Paul has is that they don't understand who Jesus is. They don't understand Jesus as the Messiah. And if you don't understand Jesus as the Messiah, then everything else is going to get thrown out of whack. So the first thing we're going to look at is, is what is Paul? Who does Paul understand Jesus to be? And what impact does that have on our lives? The other question that I want us to kind of hold as we're working through this sermon series together is this. If this was an argument that was going on today, and it actually might be, just not the same topic, right? We might not be debating circumcision, but there are other things that we debate. Whose side would you be on? In this, in this argument, whose side would you be on? I believe that as people who claim to follow the Bible and to believe that, that this is the way that we um, understand who God is, who we understand Christ is, uh, John Wesley used to say that uh, within scriptures, all things are contained therein in order to experience salvation, right? Or something like that. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But, but we believe, we say that we believe in the Bible. And we believe the truth that the Bible has to tell us. Now, if Paul wrote more than half of the New Testament, arguably we should be on the side of Paul. But the question that I have is, are we always? Do we sometimes actually inadvertently fall onto the side of the missionaries? So, so let's look at this. Let's, let me break down some of the uh, things that I was able to find as I was digging through different commentary and stuff. Um, so for Paul, the deficiencies of the missionaries' faith, it, it actually threatens the entire community. And, and this burgeoning Christian movement as a whole. In other words, what they're doing can derail everything before it even gets started. He's arguing that they've actually missed the entire point about Jesus. And like I said, then that what that does is that distorts their understanding of the Holy Spirit, it distorts their understanding of, of the church, of the people, the group that's following Jesus, and and ultimately it it deforms, it distorts their, their understanding of the entire world in light of Jesus. So the missionaries, what they're doing is they have this emphasis on circumcision and law observance, and their emphasis on these things as uh, the conditional grounds for covenant membership what Paul's arguing is that it actually negates the sufficiency of God's grace. So if you, if you want to go back and you want to live by the law, then what you're doing is you're saying all of the things that Christ did don't matter. Nothing matters. The grace that's shown through the death of Jesus for our sake is pointless if we're going to demand that you live by the law. That, that's Paul's argument. So it's what he says, it's the cross, not the law, that is our is the basis of our relationship with God. And so the missionaries have completely missed it. They 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 claim to follow Christ, yet they don't have they don't seem to care at all for what Jesus taught or did. Verses 
15 through um, 21, I, I think, are specifically important for us this morning. Because what, what Paul's saying here is that those who continue to insist on law observance as a necessary condition for anyone, specifically the Gentiles here, but for people to have full participation as people of God, that we're in effect declaring God's death, null, or Christ's death, null and void. And we're just going to go back and we're going to return to the social and religious norms that defined the status quo before Christ's death. And so this missionary's insistence on law observance as a necessary hallmark of the identity of the people of God turns out to nullify the grace of God and renders Christ's death and life meaningless. So what are the implications for us? Do we demand that people follow specific laws in order to be considered to, to be a full member of the body of Christ? Because if we're doing that, we, we're falling into the same trap that these missionaries who were part of the original Christian movement, we're falling into the same trap they are. And that we're, we're, we're in essence nullifying the life and the death and the resurrection of Christ. You see, Paul's not dumb. Paul knows that the gospel is scandalous and that it's going to cause social and religious upheaval among the influential and the powerful. Because Think about it. Those... Who in their right mind wants to give a position of... of power? Who wants to give up their seat at the table of the movers and shakers when, when being there is so beneficial to you? And, and so this, this is actually one of the things that's going on right here with the missionaries. It's actually a way to try to retain control by saying, yes, Christ did this, but we're going to require this. But I'm reminded in the book of Philippians, where Paul writes about how Christ didn't consider his, his equality with God as something to sort of lord over. Let's, let's look it up here. It's Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Paul writes this. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. So one of the things that we have to be willing to do is sort of give up our, our positions of authority and we have to hand those back over to Jesus. And we have to trust, trust in Christ and believe that Christ has changed things. And it's a scary thing, because if, if Christ has changed things, that means any, any position of authority, any, any way that I could lord over another person, I have to be willing to give that up, which includes being the one who controls the rules. The cross means that we have to love more extravagantly than the world does. Jesus tells us that they're only going to know that we are his followers by the way that we love one another. That's in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. This is the only litmus test that Jesus gives us. It's the only one that he provides. He doesn't say that following the laws, that being circumcised, that, that becoming Jewish, or, or whatever laws we want to place today on people, that that's the way that you're going to know. What he's, what he's saying is that in this diverse, mixed-up, crazy community that we're going to become, that the, only, that, that the way that we love one another, despite of our great differences, the way that we love one another is going to, is going to show the world who we are. Our welcoming of everyone, it needs to be scandalous to those who don't know Jesus. It has to not make sense. 
And this is the scandal of the cross that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. That this has to flip. We have to be the ones that flip this world upside down in a, in a way that makes people wake up to the message of Christ. Our acceptance of others should shock people. Otherwise, we're just like the rest of the world. Luke chapter 6 says this. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. That's scandalous. In other words, we can't just be like the rest of the world. We have to be willing to love and to accept everybody, regardless of whether or not they're just like us. Or how about John 3, 16 and 17? For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. This is scandalous. And it's actually offensive to those of us who are convinced of our own righteousness. Or like Peter, who Paul confronts, are worried that those who are just like us will reject us too. strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in Join me in this offertory prayer. We join together this morning with thankful hearts. We are grateful for your steadfast love. 
as we seek to glorify you with our singing and our prayers. It is also our desire to glorify you through our giving, not only our tithes, but also our service. We pray that these gifts may help our church fulfill its purpose. Help us to love all people as you intend in all that we do in this place, this community, and through our daily lives for your glory. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he turn his face to shine upon you. And may we love and welcome in such a way that it's scandalous and offensive to the rest of this world. Amen.
want to thank you for joining us for worship this morning. I pray that even though we may be separated by miles, you were able to experience love as God intends through this time of worship. I hope you'll be able to join us again next week. And in the meantime, if you're interested in getting connected further with any of the ministries of Grace United Methodist Church, I invite you to go to www.gracemj.org. May you experience God's many blessings this week.